everybody, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Amazon John. Please don't be scared. I will not bite you if you're good. <laughs> no, I'm not going to bite you because this is a virtual program, but I love virtual programs. We are going to have so much fun today and I can show you things really up close in this format that I don't always get to do if you come to the library and see us do a live show. But we do want you to keep coming back to the library. We have so many fun things planned this year. And when I found out that I got to be a part of Science Alive 2022, I brought your favorite animal because I know that everybody he loves bugs. This is a bug. This is a bug. Uh, hello, viewers. Don't insects have great big long antenna? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And don't insects have big fat heads, big giant heads? Yes, they do. How many legs does an insect have? Right, six, count them with me. One, two, three, four, hi! You only have four legs. You told me you were a bug. You're not a bug, you're a dog. And do you know what kind of dog he is? You're half right, if you said pug, he definitely has some pug in him. He's a bug. <laughs> a bug is a mix between a pug and a Boston Terrier. B for Boston, he's a bug. His name is Bugsy. <laughs> Bugsy's three going on, four years old. And I love this dog. You knew he was a dog the minute you saw him. <laughs> he's not a bug, not like an insect anyway. He's actually a wolf. Urgh. He always yawns when I do that. <laughs> okay, he's not a wolf, but isn't he closer to being a wolf than an actual ladybug or a butterfly? Yeah, see, we group animals based on their features. You know, those adaptations, we call them. The characteristics that the animals have that allow them to survive a world that is always changing. Hey, you know what I thought would be fun today? I can show you more animals, and just by studying their features, we can figure out not just how they live, but where they live, what they eat, what eats them. We can figure out how they survive. But first, Bugsy here is gonna go right back to sleep. He's gonna take a nap. That type of dog right there can sleep 30 hours a day. I know, that's incredible if you think about it. Hey, I have another friend, and this one is an animal that I know you guys have never ever, oh, oh, so jumpy, seen before. And it's right here in this, but what? Oh, you think you're so smart. Just because it's in a bag, is it a snake? I don't know. Let's just take a closer look. I want you all to notice live from our St. Joseph County Public Library, Science Alive, name that animal. <laughs> okay, wait a second. There's no such animal called, ah! I heard some of you scream. Here's the body and here's the tail. I know, isn't this amazing? Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what he is. Well, I don't know anything about animals. I started this job yesterday. I'll tell you what I do know, and I learned it from all of you. Sometimes with nature, it pays to take a closer look. For example, I want you all to no notice the, oh, wait a second, look right there. He has a hole right there on the side of his head. Hey, that's an ear. Wait a second, do snakes have ears? No, they don't. Snakes hear by feeling sound through their skin. This guy has ears. He is not a snake. So you can relax now. Or can you? <laughs> look at this. This will help you out too. Look, look. He's very wiggly. He can close his eyes. Do you see that? He can close his eyes. Can a snake close his eyes? No, because snakes don't have eyelids. Even when a snake sleeps, they sleep just like this. They're like a fish. They don't have eyelids. This guy has ears and eyelids. You want to know what he is? <laughs> you are looking at 
all the way live from the deserts of Russia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, a full grown legless lizard. A lizard with no legs, who would have thunk it? They're also called glass lizards, kind of because of the way they move. Here, if I show you his belly, you'll see he doesn't have scales that go all the way across the belly like a snake would. <laughs> so if I set him on the floor, he would try to move, but he doesn't get the same grip, the same traction that a snake gets. So a glass lizard, you can look that up next time you're here at the library. Here's another difference between him and a snake. This is all tail. Yeah, lizards can have very long tails. If this were a snake, and it's not, it would have a very little tail. Snakes have little tails, but his tail starts right there. That's the diaper area. Oh, sorry, probably a little TMI. And this lizard right here loves to hide. That's why I put him in the bag. See, now when I tie off the bag, it's like he's hiding in the desert, in the warm sand, under the ground, under a rock. <laughs> I have to keep him nice and warm because he's a reptile, a legless lizard. Hey, that was a legless lizard, but uh, <laughs> this lizard has legs. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't he cool? And what do you think? Is this lizard fast or slow? Think about that for a minute. See, you don't realize how lucky you are. If this guy were a dinosaur, he'd be a bunch of bones. You have to find the bones, dig them up, clean them off, build them like a puzzle, and only then could you ask questions. What color was he? Is he fast? Was he slow? What sound did he make? How did he move? You get to see the whole lizard just the way he is in nature. If you think he's fast, raise your hand. Okay, that's an idea. We call it a hypothesis. If you think he's slow, raise your hand. Yeah, see, that's just a different hypothesis. Wait a second. Raise your hand if you just like raising your hand. Don't! That is not science. Guys, you can't agree with everyone and everybody. And let me tell you something. Science, it's not about being right or wrong. That's what math is for. Science is about thinking for yourself. You use your own gifts, right? Then you come to the library and you check out books. You could compare this guy to other lizards that you do know. And then when you're ready, you could do an experiment. Hey, do you want to see top speed for the blue tongue skink, Asaurus? Do you? Okay. I will set him right here on this cooler. But I'm warning you, when my hands let go of his body, oh, be careful. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Top speed for the blue tongue skink, Asaurus. Take a deep breath. Look at him go! I know, I'm not making fun of him, but look at how long he is. Look at how big a, uh, oh, he can't even do a push-up. I'm not making fun of him, but he does have very dumpy little legs, which means he has another way to protect himself. Here's my hypothesis. I bet it has something to do with that big blue tongue. Am I right? See, in the desert, he sits on a rock. Notice how he's kind of colored like a rock, blending in. That's what you call, um, um, cam, 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 yeah, camouflage. Very good. See, this guy here, blending in, sitting on his rock. And if anything comes close by and scares him, you know what he does? He hisses, psst, and he sticks that big blue tongue out. Blah. He can flare this big blue tongue the size of his whole head. And if he waves it up and down, it scares the other animal away, the one that's trying to scare him. He scares it away. Isn't that weird? In nature, you'd better be fast. He's not fast. You'd better be scary. He can be scary. Or you're really good at hiding. This guy hides and waits, and if anything scares him, psst, bleh, he sticks that big blue tongue out. It's blue because nothing else in the desert is. <laughs> That's how he can scare another animal away. Of course, with his big blue tongue, he can also catch bugs. Wait a second. Don't look now. But right behind you, there on the wall, I see a fly. Don't worry. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. <laughs> it's like Godzilla. Oh, wait, I didn't say that right. Godzilla. <laughs> 
He's got a very big blue tongue. He also smells the air with his tongue. That's how snakes and lizards smell with their big blue tongue. Well, at least he does. Say goodbye, lizard. Blue tongued skink. We like lizards. Reptiles are so cool. I like reptiles almost as much as I like reading and writing. Hey, if you're going to be a scientist, you got to read reports, other, you know, people's work, stuff like that, form your ideas, but you also got to write, got to write your own reports, got to write your own finding, findings. You got to be organized. Well, when I found out that we were celebrating science together, I wrote a story, a story about this next animal and how she hunts. <laughs> it is a story about a, a, ta-da, a ferret, <laughs> a weasel. A ferret is in the weasel family. Skunk, mink, sable, ferret, my kid brother, all weasels. He's an attorney. <laughs> this story is called A Day in the Life of Kuma the Ferret. <laughs> Once upon a time, there lived in the woods a little ferret named Kuma. <laughs> and one night, Kuma was running through the forest. Do, 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 do. I mean, they run like that. It's kind of silly. She was looking for her favorite food, which she would catch using her long, sharp claws. <laughs> Very sharp claws. Oh, but look at this. She also has long, sharp teeth. That... Ow, 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 ow! Never stick your finger in a ferret's mouth. Don't stick your finger in anything's mouth. <laughs> hey, what's it mean when an animal has long, sharp teeth and long, sharp claws? It means they eat. Meat, that's right, a carnivore. And on this night, this hunter was chasing her favorite food, mice. Oh, here's where you can help me write the story. If a bear was chasing a mouse, where would the mouse go to hide? Write down a hole, that's right, a mouse hole. Hey, wait a second. Can a ferret follow a mouse down a hole? I don't know, let's find out. We'll do another experiment together. If the ferret can fit her head and shoulders through, pop, goes the weasel. <laughs> See how I did that, a weasel? If she can fit her head and shoulders through, she can get the whole rest of her body through because she's shaped like a long skinny hole. <laughs> and tunnels underground when a mouse digs them, they don't go nice and straight. No, they twist, bend, and wiggle around a tree root or around that rock under, they have to twist, bend, and wiggle. So the ferret has to be able to twist and bend and wiggle. Ah, Pilates. <laughs> and that is how the ferret gets down the tunnel, catches the mouse, twist, bends, wiggles, comes out of the tunnel, and they all lived happily ever after, except for the mouse. Don't ask about the mouse. Don't ask about the The ferret ate the mouse, okay? Are you happy now? Hey, in nature, there are predators like the ferret and there are prey like the mouse. <laughs> oh, and some of you looked a little worried when I was showing you the ferret's bendability. Is that a word, bendability? I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> don't worry, do you think that hurts the ferret? No, it's silly surprise, we don't do anything to hurt any animals. It's just her backbone is long and skinny and flexible which is a pretty neat example of that adaptation I was talking about, a characteristic that the weasel has that allows it to survive life in an ever-changing world. Everybody say goodbye, Kuma. <laughs> a ferret, a weasel, and a wonderful animal, a hunter. <laughs> now be honest, I wanna know if, um, if you like that lizard, either one with or without legs, better than the ferret, raise your hand. You like the lizard better. Okay, good. Well, I see a few hands anyway. Um, if you like the ferret better than the lizard, raise your hand. Oh yeah, no surprise. Who likes my dog best of all? <laughs> I know you're out there. Look, I'm glad you have a favorite animal. You have a favorite book, you have a favorite pizza and a bestest friend to share story time with. It's good to have favorites, but you gotta remember, in nature, every animal's different, every animal's special. Now, my favorite animals have always been covered with feathers. I like 
the birds. So today I brought for you <laughs> my new favorite jumpy big owl. I love this guy. Oh, no, no, we're not going anywhere yet. You stay right there. <laughs> I love this guy. His name is Houdini. <laughs> and he is an owl. Let me come around. I want you to see him up close. Isn't this amazing? He's called an eagle owl. An eagle owl because he's so big. And if you think he's big now, wait until he flaps his wings. <gasps> Did you see that? This bird has great big wings. Wow! But that's not all he has. It's big. Look at those eyes. His eyes are huge. His eyes are so big, he can't move his eyes. But he can do what? Turn his head. That's right. Can he turn his head all the way around? Like Linda Blair? Let's find out. Sit up straight, face me, freeze. It's time for another experiment. Don't move your shoulders, but turn your head as far as you can to one side. Oh, hi, Bugsy. And then the other. Oh, there you are, owl. See how you can turn your head to one shoulder one quarter of the way around? <laughs> owl, he can go to one shoulder over the back to the other shoulder three quarters of the way around. And he can do that because he has twice as many bones in his neck as you have. Can you feel the bones in your neck? You can't see them. They're on the inside. They're an internal physical characteristic. You have seven, seven cervical vertebrae. The owl has twice as many. He has... 12, <laughs> I mean 14. Sorry, there's three types of people in the world, those that can do math and those that can't. I was saying, with twice as many bones in his neck, this bird can see a mouse at night. Step one, see the mouse. Step two, sneak up on the mouse. Not everybody knows this, but the owls that fly at night, totally silent flight. Oh, it's true. When he flaps his wings, uh, would you stop doing that? I'm trying to talk to my friends. I'm sorry. I was saying when the owl flaps, hit his, oh, his, his wings. You could hear that? He has amazing hearing. By the way, these are not his ears. No, they're just feather tufts. His ears are actually little holes on either, okay, well, he doesn't want me to pet him, on either side of that satellite dish of a face of his, right? What do satellite dishes do? They catch signals, they catch waves, and any little bit of sound gets sent right to his ear. <laughs> Owls have one ear higher and forward, and the other a little lower and backwards, so sound reaches one ear, a split second before it reaches the other ear. And the owl can literally pinpoint where his food is. See the mouse? Sneak up on the mouse. Step three, look at these. Do you see those claws? That, oh, okay, he's got a good grip. They're called talons, and that's what he uses to grab his food. He could grab a mouse, a rat, a snake, lizard, a bird, a frog, maybe even a little bitty baby bunny rabbit. Hey. Nature isn't always pretty, you know. Owls have to catch their own food. What do you expect them to do? Open up a can of beans? No, they don't eat beans. They wouldn't fly silently if they did. Hey, once he's grabbed his food, what does he do? Right, eat it. But does he eat it on the ground? No, see, Owls have instinct. All the animals have instinct, right? The way they think, we call that a behavioral characteristics, describing how he behaves. The owl knows, catch your food and then fly up to a tree, someplace safe where he can eat. Of course, in order to fly, the owl has great big, hold on a second. I got an idea. In order to fly, the owl has great big W, I N G S. -S you can spell? Oh, that is a wise bird. Well, of course he's wise. He's hanging out with you virtually at the library. <laughs> and once he's up in his tree, that, that sharp beak of his, that's what he uses to rip his food into bite-sized chunks. Oh, and fun fact about owls, they don't digest fur and bone. So tomorrow, whatever he ate last night, 
Tomorrow he'll spit up a pellet. I mean, I'll feed him tonight, and then tomorrow he'll spit up a pellet, fur and bone. Have you ever dissected an owl pellet? Yeah, you do that in school. You, you, you separate the fur and the bone, and you can figure out exactly what the owl had to eat the night before. Every day, it's called a casting or an owl pellet. They spit it up. It's about the only way he has to brush his teeth. I, I mean, beak, because he doesn't have teeth. Oh, everybody say goodbye. Hool again. <laughs> we'll put him back in his box. He wants to go back to sleep anyway, because they come out at night, right? Oh, yeah, that was so graceful. Um, they're what you call, um, um, yeah, nocturnal. Very good. Hey, let me show you another friend of mine. And this next animal does not have scales. He does not have fur. He does not even have feathers. This next animal is covered with slime. Is it a snake? Nah, snakes have scales. Is it a snail? Is it a slug? Yeah, right, like I'm driving three hours with a slug. Whatever he is, he is slippery and wet and slimy, and I know what you're thinking. It's a frog, it's a frog. Please, we're celebrating science together. There's no way I'm coming with just some little old frog. Oh no, I had to do it. I brought a great big giant African bullfrog. <laughs> I love this guy. He's so big, we named him Bubba. Bubba is a bullfrog, and Bubba is big, and Bubba is happy in Africa as long as it's raining because he wants to be slippery and wet and sli Ew, slimy. He's dripping wet. I have to keep him in water because his skin is like a sponge. He loves his water. In fact, where he lives in Africa, hey, Africa ain't Indiana, right? Places are very different too. It's why animals have the characteristics that they have. Where Bubba lives on the grassland plains with lion, zebra, gazelle, it rains every day for months. When it's raining, Bubba is happy. He has a great big puddle. Bubba likes his puddle. That puddle is his home. But then it, it stops raining and it never rains for months. Bubba get worried. Bubba need his puddle. Bubba can't live without his puddle. When it stops raining, Bubba get worried. The dry season lasts seven months. What do you think, everyone? Can Bubba hop to another puddle? No, Bubba too big. Can Bubba run? I love that part. No, Bubba too big. Can Bubba swim to another puddle? No, say it with me, Bubba too big. And we're not making fun of Bubba, it's just look at him. He's not that kind of frog. He can't run, jump, or swim. And you know what? That's okay. Nobody's good at everything, but everybody's good at something. You wanna know what Bubba good at doing? Bubba good at sitting. Bubba sit, Bubba wait, Bubba eat a lot. Notice something. His eyes are on top of his head. If something comes to the puddle and he can grab it and swallow it whole, oh, he'll eat it up. Check it out. He'll eat other frogs, lizards, bird snakes, mice. That's what we feed him every Sunday after church. Bubba just... He just, he just grabs it. What are you jumping for? <laughs> and Bubba is happy in Africa until it stops raining. But you don't have to worry. Remember what I said? Animals have instinct. Bubba knows what to do. He digs underneath the puddle and he sleeps. Hey, what do you call it when a bear in Tennessee sleeps in the wintertime? It's called? Hibernation, very good. See, they're sleeping through the cold because they've run out of food. Well, Bubba doesn't sleep through the cold. He sleeps through the dry because he's run out of water. It's another word. It's called estivation. Estivation, Bubba estivates. It's what a hedgehog does. It's what a chinchilla does. They sleep for the dry season. And then you know what happens? April showers bring May flowers. And frog slime, and then Bubba springs back to life. I bet that's where that word comes from. Spring back to life. Bubba is happy. 
a big bullfrog. Hey, we've got frogs and toads here in Indiana too, don't we? But now that it's winter here at the library, you're not going to hear frogs and toads singing tonight because they're sleeping. Say goodbye, Bubba. We'll let Bubba go right back into his water. He's slimy. <laughs> hey, I have another friend. And this one, I think you're gonna like. In fact, this might just be the weirdest animal we've ever brought to the library. And uh, I want you to see him. And I want you to hear him too. <laughs> so hold on one second and I'll get this all set up for you. See? This next animal, sometimes animals are named for their features, okay? And this next animal is called a dwarf, hairy, screaming <laughs> armadillo. <laughs> I love this guy. His name is New Guy. Oh, and he really doesn't want for me to hold him. He's not that kind of an armadillo. So I let him sit right here in the tray. But I do want you to see how underneath, look, he has so much hair. He's a dwarf, hairy, screaming armadillo. Would you like to hear him scream? Okay, yeah, all I have to do is make him mad or, or scare him or something like that and you can hear him scream. Wait a second, does that sound like a very nice thing to do? I don't want to make him mad or scared just so you can hear him scream, which is why <laughs> I have it on video. Oh yeah, and you got to see this, but let me set him back where he belongs. And the next time you come see a silly sorry show at the library, you can even pet him. He has this really hard shell and he loves to have his back and head scratched. New guy, <laughs> a dwarf, hairy, screaming armadillo. And he sounds, this is multimedia here. This is the kind of work we do here at the St. Joe Public Library. Is that in a good spot? Here we go. I want you to hear this. This is him. Isn't that crazy? Armadillos all have a way to protect themselves. In our country, we have the nine-banded armadillo. They jump. The three-banded armadillo balls up into a ball. And the dwarf. Harry screaming armadillo screams. Isn't that cool? <laughs> In nature, every animal has a way to survive and surviving, that's what it's all about. I think for us to survive, we've got to read. We've got to come to the library. We've got to celebrate science. In fact, I called your librarians and I asked them, what animals did they most want for me to show all of you today? And you know what they said? They didn't even hesitate. All of your librarians wanted me to show all of you the, the, most dangerous animals we got. I don't know why they want me to show you such dangerous things. You're not here with me, but I'm a good boy. I do what I'm told. And I have a real live, very deadly, very dangerous snake. Okay, now see, you look worried. Let me just tell you right now, beloved, there is no such thing as a poisonous snake. They don't exist. No, they don't. Hello, vocabulary. What's the word? Yeah, venomous. Something is poisonous if you eat it and it hurts you. Certain berries, some types of mushrooms, my wife's meatloaf. Hope she doesn't watch this. Something is poisonous if you eat it and it hurts you. Something is venomous, like the snake, if it bites or stings you and it hurts you. So yes, live right now with you on video for the first time ever at a silly safari show. Oh, 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 oh. and possibly the last. I will show you a very deadly, dangerous, venomous snake. It's okay, I know what I'm doing. I've seen it on TV. It's what we're doing, right, TV? Here we go. Take a deep breath. The tail, just the tail. It can't bite anybody if I leave the head in the bag. Just the tail of the very deadly, very dangerous, most un... Ah, sorry. Wrong end. Tail of the very deadly, dangerous, venomous... 
coral snake. Huh? I know. The coral snake has venom like a rattlesnake. It affects your muscle. Your heart is a muscle. But it also has venom like a cobra, which affects your nervous system. Of course, the nervous system is in control of every other part of your body. <laughs> Very dangerous snake. But that's why I leave the head in the bag, because I'm smart like that. Help. Help. Oh, yeah, you can't really help me. And I don't want you to change the channel either. <laughs> Wait a second. You don't think this is a dangerous snake, do you? Well, you know, <laughs> science teaches us to love reading even more than we already do. And I love writing. Here's a poem. It's not my poem, but I am going to share it with you. If red touches yellow, you are one dead fellow. If red touches black, you're okay, Jack or Jill or whatever your name is. <laughs> red to yellow kills the fellow. Red to black, venom lack. See, this is an example of mimicry. Color can be amazing adaptation, right? Like camouflage for hiding. Well, in nature, bright colors mean can't touch this. That's why a poison dart frog has the most amazing colors on it, bright stripes. So you'll see it and leave it alone. Bright colors mean stay away. Fun fact though, the owl and my dog stay. Good boy. They don't see color. Dogs and owls don't see color, but they see the stripes and they know to stay away, right? We see color and it means, can't touch this. <laughs> this is a milk snake. It's not a coral snake. It's a totally harmless milk snake. His name is Dean. <laughs> Only 2% of you laughed at that joke. In South America, they tell a tale about the milk snake standing up tall in the grass at night, drinking milk from cows. Hello, do snakes drink milk? <laughs> of course not, that is utterly crazy. <laughs> utterly. <laughs> but it goes to show you, we come up with reasons not to like this stuff. Here at the library, we have so many amazing stories about snakes. I just wish that more of them had the snake being the good guy f from time to time, right? Because this is the farmer's bestest friend. Where you find cows, you find mice. And where you find mice, you find the snakes that eat them. And look at the beautiful colors on this milk snake. I love the red and the yellow. You can see his eyes. Oh, and look, he's sticking his tongue out at you too. It's how he smells. But you don't smell like a mouse. You smell like somebody who likes to read and read a lot. Same as me. <laughs> this milk snake is an amazing snake. He feels just like a basketball. He's not slimy at all. The frog is slimy. Snake isn't slimy. And he's not even a dangerous animal. Oh no, I have something for you everyone. Today I brought the, the most dangerous animal you'll ever see. Yeah, that's right. We have it right here at the library. The one, the only little bunny foo-foo. Oh, don't you give me that. This evil rabbit bops field mice on the head and that's wrong, you're a bully. You're not supposed to be bopping anybody on the head. You know they steal carrots, right? From Mr. McGregor's garden thief. You're a bad bunny. You're looking for a role model? Well, look no further than first responders, right? Any of you in the military and your amazing families that sacrifice? Healthcare workers and, of course, librarians. They inspire me and hopefully they inspire you to come join us live at the library too. But for now, it's been so wonderful filming this for all of you. <laughs> That's why I brought another role model. Look, tortoise. <laughs> tortoise and the hare. <laughs> you know what the tortoise's name is? Shelby. <laughs> hey, why'd the tortoise cross the road? to get to the Shell Station. <laughs> it's in Shelbyville. Hey, these are both reptiles. Scales, cold-blooded, and they lay eggs. The bunny, he's covered with fur. He's warm-blooded. And do bunny rabbits lay eggs? Yes, they do chocolate ones. 
okay, you're right. They give birth to live baby bunnies and soon it'll be spring and you'll be seeing baby bunnies in your neighborhood all around your front and backyard. <laughs> spring is coming and that means summer reading is right around the corner. So be sure to stay connected with us, everybody. Follow us on Facebook. Keep coming by the library and above all else, keep reading and keep loving animals and keep loving each other. Hey, thanks for letting me join all of you today celebrating Science Alive. I'm Amazon John with Silly Safaris. Say goodbye, bunny foo-foo. Don't bop anybody on the head. Be kind, everyone. Bye.